since I offered to take requests, the first one I saw was someone asking me to talk about The Borrowers, the 1997 film I produced starring Jim Broadbent, John Goodman, Mark Williams, Arthur yeah. Weasley, Hugh Laurie, among others, and a very young Tom Felton. For those who don't know, The Borrowers are little people, so the whole movie is about the scale of the bean, that's the human beings versus the tiny borrowers. Toward a force of complex visual effects done in the non-digital era, so that's what makes it particularly interesting. There's so many complex and cool shots in it. Kudos to the director, Peter Hewitt, for his stunning creativity. And instead of picking a single shot to explain, I decided, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole and decided to talk a little bit more about the whole approach to doing something this complicated and this really difficult film for under $30 million. The film is so complicated that, in fact, when we were nominated for a BAFTA for Best Visual Effects, the main visual effects team from the Titanic came over to our table and started picking the brains of our genius visual effects supervisor, Peter Chang. They had all the money and time and talent available, and they came to us to ask us how we managed some of the shots. Yeah, Titanic. Yeah, wow. I'm pretty sure that one of the shots they were asking about was the fishbowl shot. Let's start with some backstory. I was asked to take over the film when the producer fell ill, and I came in with the film well underway. All the complicated uh, sequences had already been storyboarded, and much of the construction of the huge props and sets were in progress. The production designer was the epic Gemma Jackson of Game of Thrones fame, to name just one of her incredible credits, and the film look is stunning. So I showed up fresh from L.A. with jet lag and straight into a massive visual effects meeting and quickly discerned that the ambition of the film was significantly beyond the budget. I sent a handwritten note to the line producer saying, I think we might be screwed. Which, of course, I would not tell the executives because my job was to get us out of the hole that was pre-dug for me. Every time the train was derailing, however, the line producer would wave the note at me with a wry look on her face. Before I arrived, the team had chosen a scale of 14 to 1, meaning the humans were 14 times the size of the borrowers. So here are two paperclip props that I borrowed from the show, and this gives you a feel for the scale. So why 14 to 1? Well, that made the borrowers about 5 inches tall, which was Peter Hewitt's choice. I did some homework just now to see if Mary Norton, the book's author, actually defined their scale, but I couldn't find any reference to it. I did, however, find a re this really cool paper from the Journal of Interdisciplinary Sciences, which explained why humans could not be that small. Good to know. But frankly, why did they not choose 10 to 1? I mean, 10 to 1 would have made things so much easier. All the computations could have been done in your head by adding or subtracting a zero. But more importantly, the oversized props could have been 30% smaller, much more manageable and much cheaper, leaving room for us to have more of them. So let's say that you're building an oversized toaster, and I choose this because that's my daughter at two years old, and I just really love this shot. There she is, live action with a 14 times toaster. And look at the dirt on the grout, and look at the dirt on the countertop. Even that had to be scaled up by 14 times, or it just didn't look right. This is nicely shown in the costumes. Here's a special costume that the wardrobe department made for my daughter for the millions of borrowers shot. So her stripy suit is actually corduroy blown up 14 times. And that's, of course, an oversized snap in the middle of it. And there was just such incredible, beautiful care taken on all the details. Moving on, to understand the effects in the movie, there are just some simple basics which may seem really obvious to you. The easiest shots were where the borrowers were in their own environments, which were just done on oversized sets, and I say just with care because they were easy to shoot, but building those oversized sets was incredibly expensive because everything had to be manufactured from scratch. And it wasn't just the cost, it was the time. The art department was stretched to the max. Of course, any time the borrowers were in the same frame as the human beings, we had to do composited VFX shots, and either on blue or green screen. This is best explained by this cool cube that I kept as a souvenir. This is a borrower-sized one, um, and we also had ones that were painted green and blue for the human size uh, and for the green screen stage. For any shot where we were matching a shrunken visual to a regular set, we would overlay the shots and use these cubes to line up the X, Y, and Z axes. While this isn't revolutionary, we've been doing the land of the giant type material in films since early filmmaking. 
But the complexity of the shots in this movie was what was remarkable, particularly because there were complicated camera moves in many of the shots, so they had to be replicated for speed and angle and timing between the green screen stage and the regular set. Unlike the digital world now, where it's fairly easy to fix anything that isn't, or seems like anything that isn't quite right, in the non-digital days, you had to get each element of the film right, or you would be fixing it, or fixing it would be a nightmare, and a, particularly a nightmare in costs. An example of a particularly difficult shot, and this is the one of the ones I think the Titanic people were asking about, take a look at Arietti in the fishbowl. Wow. Go on, go ahead, Ben. Get it over with. This is incredible. You can talk. Get what over with? The squishing? You aren't going to squish me, so get on with it. Why would you want me to do that? I don't want you to do it. It's just what beans do. What's a bean? You are a human being. I think you mean... Ah, uh, never mind. Look, I'm not going to squish you. You're not? No, of course not. This is amazing. I knew something strange was going on in our house, but I never ever imagined that our stuff was being stolen, stolen. by- Stolen? No, no, no. We don't steal, we borrow. We're borrowers, and you're our bean. Beans provide you with things to borrow. But they'll squish you soon as they look at you. Who told you that? My dad. What's so difficult? Well, first of all, dropping her out of the tin and connecting her with her landing then about a minute or so of dialogue and the camera move that looks through the distortion of the glass. And don't forget, the glass also needs to reflect the other side of the room with the correct distortion. In the digital world, this is a shot with some complexity, but not really that much. You'd probably create a digi-double of uh, Arietti to do the spin and then blur connect her to the real Arietti, lots of reference of the room for the reflection, fishbowl in the real room, some concerns about the camera reflecting in the convex glass that showed everything, but all easily painted out and fixed digitally. For those of you who are inexperienced with these elements, I'll break this down a little further. There are a lot of elements to the shot, but let's start with how we put Arietti in the fishbowl. First, we shot on the real set with Pete talking to a stick and Arietti off camera doing her dialogue so we could get the timing and the most naturalistic performances. Then we shot Arietti on the blue screen stage Note the cubes that match the edges of the fishbowl. Pete was there to make sure her performance timing and intensity was correct as well. And we had his eyeline position carefully calculated so she could look at his eyes. Then the effects team removed the blue and placed her in the fishbowl. In many ways, that's the most straightforward part of the shot. So let's also talk about the camera move, which has to match absolutely perfectly the speed and distance and angle on the set, but at 14 times. So motion control is required, a computerized system that in those days was expensive and agonizingly cumbersome. Once the first part of the shot was completed, the motion control camera had to be hand-programmed, hand-programmed, I'm saying it again, to match it on the green screen, but with the 14 times factor. Sometimes we did shots so complicated it took one or two days just to do the programming. Now, of course, it would all be done inside the computer in nanoseconds with tools like the Techno Dolly, and it would be amazing. So when I found these storyboards, I was interested to see my note that we put Arietti on a seesaw or teeter-totter to get her lowered the distance on the blue screen until she landed on the coins. I also wondered whether the coins would have been done on the blue screen with oversized coins or whether they would have been in the fishbowl. And I was interested to see that, yes, we had oversized coins on the blue screen stage, and I'd venture a guess that they were protecting against the idea that if they moved while she was landing or walking around, they didn't want to have to recreate that from static objects. So that's one shot. But I want to talk about another one that's a little bit less obvious. So we have a special guest for this segment. When I edited the segment together, I sent it to Tom to take a look, and I was particularly interested in showing it to him because he and I had just worked together on A Babysitter's Guide to Monster Hunting, which you can check out on Netflix, plug. He plays the Grand Guignol with grand aplomb. During the shoot, he came over to dinner and I pulled out some of the props and storyboards and visual effects boards that I had from the movie. And I realized as he was looking through it, wait a minute, of course he had no idea what went into making the film. He was only, he was a total noob, he was only eight. That, I, I think that's the strange thing as well for me when I see this was the very first filming experience I'd ever had. I did a 
commercial before that um, <laughs> where I was just the young grandson being taken around America by his grandfather to try and promote some sort of pension scheme or something. But this was, uh, I just, I can't stress enough how much I just thought it was fun and normal. How would I know any different? So for him, seeing the behind the scenes for the first time when he was old enough to understand was a, kind of a revelation. And it was like sending him back in time and forward in time at the same time. When I look at the set, it, that's not a fake mirror thing. They built an entire <laughs> oversized wall. Um, so basically you've ruined it for every other film from now. This is but, so cool, though, for me to look back at and see, wow, like the, the actual, um, the attention to detail is the thing that really, to me, makes a great movie and a uh, film rather. And seeing the, uh, the you know, the, the oozing, um, what is it? Not polystyrene, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the... The cement coming through. I mean, the details that Gemma sure. Jackson brought in, it's just gorgeous. To see it now, this is 25 years later. Go on, roll the tape. Let's see it. Uh, here we am. <laughs> Don't sneeze, pea green. Come on, mate. There. Comes Arthur Weasley. I remember that vividly. <laughs> I mean, look at this. Yeah. It's so cool. Back. Yeah. Just say I don't I don't remember how because uh, I know because you talk about there how that was one sequence. Feel better? Yeah. The first time that you were closer to you guys, we actually had a huge hammer claw come in. Do you remember that? Yes, that's the thing I remember, yeah, because it was like Three, two, one. <laughs> Before we go any deeper, this isn't even the shot that I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about the main running sequence. The super bummer of this is that the original shot was a long piece of Arietti and Pea Green running down the inner beam and the explosions going off right near them. The sequence is more exciting with all the intercuts, but it was certainly a cooler shot when it was uncut. This happens a lot. You do some spectacular one -er, and then it works better to cut it up and damn it. You could have saved so much time and effort if you'd just done it in the small pieces. But where's the coolness and challenge in that? It often happens, particularly on a TV episode, that you shoot a really cool shot and you put your technical tour de force in your director's cut and you come back and find the producers have not appreciated your artistry and have cut into it to get to the close-ups. And sometimes they're right and it's better storytelling, but sometimes they're being predictable and sometimes you just simply disagree and that nail in your heart will always be there forever leaking bits of your artistic soul. I have a lot of them. <laughs> but in this case, we all decided together that the edit was better with all the intercuts, so I'm probably the sole person pining to show off the original shot. So I pieced together the original shot from the pieces of the film and there's a jump cut here and there, but it gives you an idea of what it looked like originally. There's no hammer claws. It's just explosions. But it's all so fast that you can't tell. But the because of course the cost of just building that one hammer claw was to do one. And the first time round, they come to me and they say, well, we're just gonna, you, you need to build 10 hammer claws. <laughs> and <laughs> to, you know, these massive hammer claws. And Gemma Jackson and uh, just comes in like, I can't build 10 of those. We bed, didn't even budget one large one. We thought you were gonna do it all your way. Well, yeah, and let alone destroying destroying the the, the walls on the side. Uh, I, 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 it strikes me now, I don't remember exactly the ins I and outs of that. I feel like we, um, that you were on green or, but you may have been on a beam and had to leap. Do you have, I don't know if you remember. I just remember that run that we did or whatever the, whatever the little hops we did were very time controlled and very, uh, yeah, well, yeah. 
the hops were very like uh, stunt men were around us. I remember lots of explosions. <laughs> it's mental. It's mental. So again, let's do the thought experiment. How would we do this now in the digital age? Easiest solution would be to run them through the set, then do digital explosions. Pretty much piece of cake. Or if, as was our case, we couldn't afford the large set, especially for the short sequence, we do some small elements and the rest would be set extensions built with digital reference. But in our case, we, had, we couldn't do the set extensions. We had to build the small set uh, and explode it and then run the kids on the green screen with their trajectory taped out and the places they had to jump all taped on the floor and use the motion control camera for the camera move. And the timing of the explosion and the lighting cues had to be seamless and the debris flying at the right time. And I remember when we tempted together, there was applause that the whole shot worked so well. I think I think the memory the memory I have is there was exactly what you just saw there. Granted, maybe only one section or two, it felt like. I remember the day, because this is the day that, that Peter Peter Hewitt, I recall saying, you can't keep doing this. As far as laughing, I was just having too much fun. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't keep doing this. And that was, the, that was the first time I, for some reason, I remember being not reprimanded, but at least told this isn't all shits and giggles, um, which, which it uh, you know, <laughs> inevitably was to me. But um, yeah, it was like a massive part of the set. I just remember the, the, what you, the, the, the timing uh, thing that you're saying of like, you jump here and there was uh, a certain element of like, yeah, the timing had to be so specific for it to work. Um, and then, I, of course, I remember the, the giant claw hammer <laughs> coming in. Because isn't that how Pea Green gets, that, that's how he gets taken out, isn't it? Yeah, because it comes in and then it pulls you out and then you go on to the light bulb. Haunts me to the day. So my greatest producerial challenge on the show was the scheduling because we had to run green screen stage and second unit and first unit all this at the same time. And the actors required on all units and the shock for everyone was the green screen or blue screen stage had to be reconfigured for each shot. Maybe the borrowers had to be up on platforms because the camera was lower than the horizon. Or maybe they needed green shapes to interact with, a green fork, for instance, so their hands would be in the right positions. And visual effects didn't want to use a real oversized fork because it was have, would have been a huge green mirror. And then with all that green reflecting on it, when you green screened it out, it would disappear anyway. Or maybe the green screen stage actually needed to be the blue screen stage for the shot. And of course, we didn't have money for two different stages, so that needed to be swapped over. So I had the schedule on post-its on numerous calendars and I'd be moving back and forth between them and moving elements as everything changed. And it was like playing a three-dimensional tic-tac-toe to make sure all the elements would be ready for whichever set we'd be shooting at once. The biggest shot we did was the Millions of Borrowers shot, which was at least 40 elements and five shooting days and including all the shooting costs was around a million pounds just for the one shot. It's an amazing shot, but take a look. Was it worth the cost? I learned a ton on this film, but particularly that digital is a lifesaver. I'm quite proud of my performance there. I hate milk. My mum always reminds me of that line. <laughs> <laughs>